So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Amber. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm one of the Spine Fellows here uh, this year. And today uh, we'll be talking about um, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis and uh, delve in a little bit more to the classification. So uh, a very uh, small bit about the history. Um, it was first termed um, by Galen in 131 uh, to 201 AD. It's derived from the Greek word that means um, crooked and it ended up becoming um, the symbol for orthopedics in general. Um, and this was devised by uh, Andre in 1741. Um, as far as the definition of scoliosis, so it is termed um, uh, considered a scoliosis when the coronal plane deformity uh, measures greater uh, than a 10, 10 degrees um, on the AP radiograph uh, by a Cobb angle. If it measures less than that, that's considered um, what we call spinal asymmetry and is non-pathologic. There are different types of scoliosis, including idiopathic, congenital, and neuromuscular. Idiopathic um, by far uh, comprises the majority of patients that are seen with um, scoliosis, and it'll be the topic that is uh, the primary focus of today. Um, just briefly about neuromuscular scoliosis, it's caused by um, an inability to control the muscles that support the spine. This is a patient that has spinal muscular atrophy on the uh, left, and it's um, kind of classically seen as this large C-type curve. Congenital scoliosis is more um, a failure of the formation of the, of the spine, um, either in the form of a defect of segmentation or a defect of formation. You can see the two different types there. Um, we're not going to go into those in detail because uh, that's beyond the scope of the talk. Um, with regards to idiopathic scoliosis, there are um, are multiple different classifications based on the age of the child um, with infantile and juvenile primarily making up uh, what we now know as uh, early onset scoliosis. But today we'll be focusing more on adolescent. So a little bit about the prevalence and etiology. Um, it's obviously more pre prevalent in uh, females and this actually becomes more important when you talk about uh, the degree of the curves and the curves that require intervention. Um, so you can see below the ratios, you can see that it's actually a one-to-one -one ratio in males to females for um, smaller asymmetry curves. And then once you reach the diagnosis of uh, actual scoliosis, you see that the predilection towards female gender increases substantially until you get to about a 7.2 to one ratio in curves that require an orthopedic intervention. Um, so obviously, uh, if you're seeing a, a, a patient in clinic and it happens to be a female, you know that her curve is one, more likely to progress to a greater degree, and two, more likely to require an orthopedic intervention. Um, there are multiple um, kind of focuses of uh, uh, research on the etiology of scoliosis current um, uh, research is primarily focused on uh, neurological dysfunctions, connective tissue abnormalities, and genetic factors. Prior theories kind of delved into the biomechanical or, or nutritional deficiency, structural defects, and um, endocrine abnormalities. A little bit more about kind of current areas of research. So um, with regards to neurological dysfunction, this is a study that looked at the vibratory responses in patients who had had idiopathic scoliosis, and they used SSEPs and looked at the vibratory responses in the patients uh, between their left and right sides, and they found an overall asymmetry in those responses. And so this kind of concept supported that um, potentially uh, an aberration in the function of the posterior column might contribute to an overall uh, role in the formation of scoliosis. They've also looked at uh, the role of melatonin. So um, it is produced in the pineal gland. Um, in this study, what they looked at was a pinealectomy in a chicken. And what they found was that when they performed the pinealectomy, the chicken developed scoliosis. However, after they administered the melatonin, um, despite having um, the pineal gland removed, the chickens still went on to develop um, progression of their scoliosis. And so there's a debate regarding its overall role um, um, in uh, scoliosis. Um, a little bit about the connective tissue abnormalities. So 
Um, in this study, they looked at uh, the ligamentum flavum in scoliotic patients and found that when compared to control patients, it was found to have a disarranged fibers, a marked decrease in the amount of fiber density and a non-uniform uh, distribution, which um, pot potentially suggested that an el elastic fiber system uh, may play a role in the pathogenesis. And here's a, a nice slide um, from that, uh, uh, or pictures from that paper. On the left, you can see the nice organized fibers um, of the ligamentum flavum on the left, as well as the uh, higher density. And you can see kind of the disorganization in patients with AIS on the right. There are a multitude of genetic factors that are being evaluated. We know that AIS has um, a genetic uh, predisposition to inheritance. Um, several studies primarily performed in the 1960s and 1970s revealed high prevalence of familial scoliosis. Um, and uh, uh, in multiple multiple of these studies, it was found to have, have an autosomal dominant um, inheritance. Uh, recent areas of uh, uh, focus have been focused on the LBX1 locus and its uh, potential contribution to AIS. A little bit about the pathophysiology. So um, scoliotic sc spines are not just um, these curved spines. They do develop differently, and there's a different anatomy um, uh, within the vertebral body's pedicles and lamina itself. So the vertebral bodies um, rotate towards the convex side. Um, the greatest rotational changes are seen at the apex of the curve with kind of a dissipation towards the ends. Um, the spines processes typically uh, rotate towards the concavity of the curve. And over time, what we see is that the compression and distraction forces that are associated with the curve act upon uh, the patient's spine, the growing spine, most importantly, and result in a wedge-shaped uh, change in the vertebra, which results in a higher uh, side on the convex side and a lower side on the concave side. And so this harkens back to our orthopedic uh, principles, including uh, the huter boltman law. Uh, it also then uh, results in changes in the neural canal and the posterior arch. We see that the lamina on the convex side are more broad and widely separated, whereas those on the concave side are more narrow and close together. And then most importantly for our pedicle screw fixation, we see that the pedicles are shorter um, and thinner uh, on the concave side. So uh, con uh, pedicle screw placement on that side will be more difficult. This leads to another uh, point of discussion about potential etiology. So people have um, evaluated uh, this idea of the neuro, uh, neuro, neurocendral uh, synchondrosis, and basically it's a physis in the spine. It's uh, located here at the junction um, of the pedicle and the vertebral body. And uh, ultimately it results in the growth of both the vertebral body and the posterior arch. Uh, so they have hypothesized in certain situations that if a disruption of the neurocentral uh, synchondrosis occurs, this might uh, potentially result in a relative excess growth on the unaffected side and lead uh, to both a coronal and axial plane deformity. For the orthopedists, almost uh, similar to an eight-plate screw fixation uh, when we try to control the physis and distal femurs and proximal tibias in patients with limb um, uh, deformities. So this is a study where they actually did that. So they um, put unilateral pedicle screw um, uh, fixation across the neurocentral synchondrosis in rabbits. And what they found was that uh, the rabbits did indeed uh, develop a uh, scoliotic curve. So what we can see is that it, there's a lot of potential etiologies for um, AIS, and it hasn't fully been vetted out, but likely a multitude of uh, contributing factors. So if you see a patient in clinic, um, it's important to know kind of what uh, the potential of their curve uh, uh, progression is. Um, in general, patients with untreated curves less than 20 degrees are relatively low risk for progression, but there are a multitude of factors, um, including the patient's gender, uh, uh, the remaining growth, and the curve magnitude that all um, contribute to the potential uh, curve progression.
So with regards to gender, we kind of talked about this already, but the majority of curve progression occurs um, in female uh, patients. Um, with regards to the phases of maturity, there are multiple different staging systems that you can use to kind of predict um, where in their stage of growth they are, and we'll kind of uh, briefly touch on those. And then also, the larger the curve magnitude, the larger the risk of um, curve progression. So this is the RISR staging system. We're all very familiar with it. It is a growth plate on the iliac uh, wing. And as uh, you uh, see progression of the growth plate from um, the uh, more anterior uh, uh, portion of the wing traveling posterior, you see um, a more complete uh, growth and uh, 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 completion of their um, um, growth cycle. There, uh, this study actually looked at modifying this RISR, the, the typical RISR grading system that was um, uh, talked about in the literature that um, predicts kind of an accelerated phase of female uh, idiopathic scoliosis. And basically what they did is they added um, a, a caveat of the triradiate cartilage. So if the triradiate cartilage was uh, closed versus open, um, you would see a more rapid stage of uh, progression. So obviously, if the triradiate cartilage was open, um, it was a better predictor of curve progression. And the reason that they added this is because of um, this concept of the peak height velocity. So um, what we see is that uh, uh, patients actually re their, reach their peak height velocity before um, the RISR staging even starts to occur, and even before the triradiates um, close. So uh, this is a, a measurement of the maximal uh, skeletal growth that occurs in adolescence. Um, on average, for uh, female uh, North American girls, we see that the average age occurs at about 11 and a half years old. And um, again, we see that the closure of the triradiate uh, cartilage actually occurs after this peak height velocity um, and menarche. And so for this to be useful, though, um, if you're going to use it in clinic, you actually have to get serial height measure measurements in order to try to predict this. Other things that people have used in clinic include uh, the Tanner White House score, um, which is uh, based on the radiographic appearance of the epiphyses of the distal ends of the distal radius and um, uh, small bones of the hand. And then as far as the curve magnitude, so um, immature patients with curves greater than 20 degrees are at a substantial risk for progression of spinal deformity. So uh, this study actually looked at the prediction of uh, curve progression in patients in un untreated idiopathic scoliosis. And what you see is that based on their RISR grade, um, there was less of a rate of uh, progression if their curves were smaller. But you did see a, an extremely large um, progression of curves if the curves were larger and they were er, uh, earlier in their RISR grade, which we expect as they are not skeletally mature. But you also saw that in the larger curves, they had a higher rate of progression despite being in a more advanced stage of maturity. And so it's important to realize that the larger curves are more likely to progress. A little bit about the clinical features and physical exam. So one third of adolescents actually do complain of back pain. Um, there is a significant association uh, with patients that have uh, uh, an older age, uh, more uh, maturity, if they're post if they have a greater spinal deformity. But only 10% of these patients have an identifiable source. And these are some of the most common uh, causes. So kind of the differential diagnosis of pain in a patient with uh, scoliosis. And I think the thing to take away from in this slide is that if a patient has a left thoracic curve and it's painful, that is the most predictive um, underlying, that is the most predictive of an underlying pathological condition. And, and an MRI is definitely indicated. And um, so this is why uh, uh, you can get uh, different things, syrinxes, tethered cords. Um, this is an example of, of a tethered cord pathology. Um, with regards to your physical exam, so inspection, things that might give you a potential sign, so midline hemangiomas, hair tufts, dimpling, um, other things to look at in your inspection. So examining the patient's iliac crests, if they're uneven, um, that might give you a clue that the patient actually has a curve that's associated with a lower uh, limb length discrepancy.
Uh, we do the Adams forward bin test. Um, I'm not going to go through how we do it, uh, but it's kind of mentioned there on the slide. But basically, we're looking at um, the vertebral rotation and how that contributes to one side of the uh, back appearing higher than the other. Um, and this is actually an objective measure that can then be documented over time. You can also perform a plumb line. Um, basically, the plumb line uh, should not deviate from the center of the gluteal crease more than one to two centimeters. And you can also measure the trunk balance. And um, I'm not going to go into detail about how to measure this, um, but uh, these are all things that can be performed in the physical exam. Uh, on the neurological examination, so the superficial abdominal reflexes are important. Um, they can be used to determine uh, which patients should undergo an MRI. Um, you start at the outer edge of the abdomen, you stroke in towards the umbilicus, and you look for deviation uh, towards the side on which the test is performed. And so those reflexes should be symmetric. Um, the radiographic evaluation, we all know how to draw a Cobb angle, so I'm not going to go into the uh, details of that, as well as lumbar lordosis and thoracic kyphosis. These are the normal measurements um, that should be obtained in, in patients without pathology. Uh, you can also look at the coronal balance, um, which is similar to the plumb line, but only a radiographic evaluation. And then, of course, uh, the bending films. So uh, more onto the classification. So we'll talk about King and we'll talk about Lanky. Uh, but first, a couple of definitions. So the upper end vertebra, um, this is the uh, septmocephalad vertebra with the superior surface that's most tilted uh, towards the concavity of the curve. And just the opposite is the lower end vertebra. The apical vertebra is defined as the most laterally deviated vertebra um, uh, from the axis that passes through the sacrum, or as we know it, the central sacral vertical line. Uh, the neutral vertebra is the vertebra without uh, rotation. And the stable vertebra is the uh, uh, last vertebra that is most closely bisected by the central sacral vertical line. So uh, King was the first to try to classify all of this. In 1983, he published a, a review of the results of uh, 405 different patients. Um, importantly, these patients had been treated by John Moe with Harrington rod instrumentation. And the overall goal was to attempt to define the criteria that Mo was using to perform selective thoracic fusion in his patients. Um, this was the first uh, classification to describe the most common types of idiopathic scoliosis and then actually make a treatment recommendation based on the types of curve. This was also the first time that selective fusion and the idea of preservation of motion was first introduced. So King first uh, used this idea of the stable zone of Harrington, which was um, these two goalposts that were drawn up from the sacrum, and then recommended, um, you can see the two gray vertebra, but uh, considered the stable vertebra. And he made the recommendation that you, you know, end your uh, 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 fusion in, in this area. This uh, eventually transitioned to the central sacral vertical line um, as we know it today. And so here is the King classification. Um, I'm not going to read each curve, um, but uh, basically he, he based um, his classification uh, on where the uh, larger curves were. And then this idea of the flexibility index, which is basically an idea of what was the percentage of the thoracic and um, lumbar curves on the lateral build, uh, bending films. And he's basically trying to establish what a structural curve is and what a non-structural curve is. And here's his ca uh, calculation for this. And then he um, defined, then defined these curves based on the classification uh, below. So these are just examples of all of the different classifications of uh, curves. And then he made recommendations based on these curves. So, um, uh, he first introduced this idea of selective thoracic fusion in patients who had a type 2 curve. Um, and what he kind of turned this was the lower vertebra that is both neutral and stable. Um, if the neutral vertebra was uh, and stable vertebra were different, then he recommended choosing the stable vertebra. So we, uh, if you look at the follow-up on King, unfortunately, patients, we did see that uh, there was a large decompensation in the lumbar spine when the King recommendations were used. And specifically, that was with regards to the current um, segmental instrumentation systems that we now use today with pedicle fixation. Um, and so 
collectively what these studies found was that um, King had developed his system during the Harrington rod fixation era, and this would then not re reliably predict the response of the curves um, with segmental fixation. It also was found to have a low inter-observer reliability and intra-observer reliability. And so in response to this uh, was the development of the Lanky classification as we know it today. And so we'll kind of dissect that in a little bit of detail. Um, so that's kind of a summary slide of the Lanky classification, but we'll kind of buy, uh, go into more detail about it. So there are six main curve types, um, an easy way to kind of uh, divide these in your mind. And uh, Dr. Mundus, I credit for kind of teaching me all of this. But uh, so the first uh, four types are main thoracic curves. Um, so the structural curve then is um, uh, uh, the main curve in types one through four. And then in types um, five and six is the thoracolumbar lumbar curve. What defines what we consider the main curve? So it's the largest curve. Um, it has the largest cob, uh, and it also does uh, not bend out uh, uh, in the lateral bending films. Uh, so here you can see the uh, main structural curves being in the thoracolumbar lumbar and lumbar spine. He also introduced this idea of the sagittal plane. Harrington only based his classification on um, patients who, uh, on the AP films uh, with regards to coronal uh, measurements. And so Lanky actually added um, in the sagittal plane, because as we know, um, uh, scoliosis is a, a multidimensional deformity. So uh, this is kind of how he uh, uh, distributed the, the different curves. Um, and this is where he introduced um, kind of this uh, uh, concept of having the sagittal plane being important, where he talked about um, the uh, structural criteria, meaning that the T2 to T5 kyphosis or the T10 to 12 kyphosis in general, the kyphosis um, greater than 20 degrees of the curve indicated it was more of a structural curve. He then added modifiers. So this is with regards to the central sacral vertical line that we had seen introduced in the King classification. And he also added uh, these, mod these uh, sagittal profile modifiers that you can see on the right. So we'll go into a little bit more detail about the modifiers. So a lumbar modifier A um, is the central sacral vertical line uh, ending between the pedicles of the stable vertebra um, with no to minimal scoliosis and rotation. So again, it, this is based, the A is based on the um, stable vertebra. The B and the C are actually related to the apical vertebra. So the central sacral vertical line will just touch the apical vertebra, either the body or the pedicles to be considered a lumbar uh, modifier B. And then in a lumbar modifier C, the apical vertebra basically is uh, way out of the field, does not touch the central sacral vertical line at all. And so this is a table kind of looking at each of those different um, curve types and how they then fall into the modifier um, classification. And so why is all of this important? Well, it helps to predict um, a surgical intervention. So I'll just briefly mention a little bit about um, selective fusion. So why do we care about selective fusion? Well, the advantages are that we maintain the, the lumbar spine motion segments. We get correction of our main thoracic curve and the idea is that we're getting better long-term health of the spine. The disadvantage is, is that you could, one, get an incomplete correction, and this can ultimately result in a truncal shift and greater decompensation, which might then lead to an additional procedure. So does that actually kind of vet out in the literature? Um, so these are two studies that looked at proximal fusion levels in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Um, that looked at the motion of the spine. So Wilk et al. compared uh, uh, 34 patients who had fusion, 32 patients who did not have fusion, and 25 control patients. And what they found was that uh, those who had fusion down into the lumbar spine did indeed um, have decreased motion when compared to those who um, only had a thoracic fusion. And this was further um, uh, exemplified by Ingberg et al. Um, and then does that actually lead to a clinical um, uh, uh, complication or, or adverse outcome? Uh, Panosa and Angler uh, reported that patients had 
um, greater back pain scores, difficulty with activities of daily living, more pain medications, more episodes of back pain if you fuse to L3 or below. And this was also found by Cochran, um, who looked at uh, uh, the functional changes and demonstrated more low back pain, degenerative facet joint changes, and disc space narrowing in patients who had had a fusion to L4 or 5. The one problem with these two studies is that these patients were examined with Harrington implants, and Harrington implants work by distraction, and that can lead to a flat back deformity. So it's unclear whether or not it was the selective fusion uh, versus extended fusion that led to these kind of adverse outcomes or um, kind of the Harrington rod fixation itself. This is an example of a selective fusion where we didn't quite, the patient didn't quite get what she needed. So um, on the preoperative radiograph seen in A and B, you see a 75 degree thoracic curve and a 57 degree lumbar curve. These are the two-year postoperative radiographs. They demonstrate good correction of the thoracic curve, but you do see um, a significant um, uh, uh, truncal shift to the left, and that's because um, there was incomplete uh, correction of the lumbar uh, curve with the fusion. Um, we talked about uh, King for the type 2 curves recommending um, um, a selective fusion, um, and that's seen um, on the left there, an example of a King type 2 curve that would be recommended uh, to undergo a selective thoracic fusion. This is a very nice table to just kind of keep um, uh, as a real quick snapshot to look at when you're uh, selecting fusion. It's a review article in uh, JOS that uh, looks at the different lanky type curves and kind of talks about choosing your upper instrumented vertebra versus your lower instrumented vertebra and all the different literature and uh, summarizing it. So I tried to put everything together based on what uh, Lanky made on his recommendations. And so in the, in the Lanky paper, in the original paper, he talks about these kind of recommendations for choosing your lower instrumented vertebra. So in curve fives, uh, curve type fives and curve type six, in a five, he's, he recommends including only uh, the thoracolumbar lumbar spine. In a curve six, he recommends including um, um, both uh, the TL and L spine curves. Um, and the uh, minor structural curves. And then for the rest of the curve types, he recommends using the lumbar modifier. So for an A or B, you look at whether or not the patient has kyphosis. If the kyphosis is present, um, and that's the 20 degree kyphosis, you include the lumbar spine. If it's not present, you do not include the lumbar spine. Um, in a C-type curve, he basically separates it based on the curve types. Um, so if it's a 1C or a 2C, you include the lumbar spine, and you do not have to include it if it's any other uh, a curve type uh, not associated with a 1C or 2C. So then there was a follow-up um, study that looked at patients who had uh, lumbar modifier Cs, um, and this study suggested that actually patients who had lumbar curves with C modifiers do not necessarily have to be included in the fusion mass, and they recommended more consideration of a selective fusion. So then uh, Lanky came back and kind of gave this uh, secondary paper that um, looks at specifically the organization of his uh, classification and how to use it as a template to perform selective fusions. And he introduced these ideas of the um, main thoracic to thoracal lumbar ratio, um, the apical vertical translation, and the apical vertical rotation. And if these criteria were met um, in the patient, uh, a, uh, you were more likely to develop a well-balanced correction that could be uh, performed with just a selective thoracic fusion. So putting it all together, this is my kind of summary slide of, hey, if I'm looking at this, what, what am I going to do? How could I try to come up with my um, uh, prediction of my fusion? Um, so one, I would determine the structural curve types. Um, obviously, all structural curves need to be included in the fusion, and then this gives you your classification. Secondly, determine the UIV. So if there's no structural proximal thoracic curve, you should consider the patient's shoulders. So in the shoulders, if they're even or uneven, if they're even, go to T3 in general. If they're uneven, consider which side is higher, left or right, and then you can choose your fusion. Usually left sides need a more proximal fusion, so to T2, and right sides need a T4. And then if you do have a proximal thoracic curve, T2 is safe. 
And then trying to determine the LIV, use your lumbar modifiers, as we kind of talked about here. And that's a summary of that kind of algorithm. And then also another consideration is maybe considering the flexibility of the disc below the LIV. And not forget these ratios and uh, their importance in helping to predict who might be successful in a, uh, uh, a selective fusion. And that's what I got for you. Here are all my works cited. Um, and thank you. Well, great summary, Amber. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I agree. You great job. Well done. I can make a large presentation just on trying to select the LIV. <laughs> yeah. What did what did these two think of um, different strategies for selecting a floor instrumented vertebra? Do they have any comments? Oh, these these children. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. They I think don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, Greg. Leave my spinal. Um, exactly. <laughs> The only other comment I'll make, there's uh, actually uh, um, some data out now that's looking at the tilt of L4 relative to LIV selection. So they call them mainly within A groups that have a normal lumbar modifier, but some have a normal lumbar modifier, but have a tilt to the left and some a tilt to the right. Um, and uh, there's some different thoughts on changing your fuse selection based on that. So that, you know, there's another concept out there called the last touched vertebrae. So if you have um, uh, the x-ray, you just draw a, a, a gravity line uh, from, the, from the sacrum, so your central sacral line. Um, and the last touched vertebrae is usually you're pretty close to almost always going to be your, um, your LIB. Um, so that's another easy kind of way to think about it. Um, but if your L4 is tilted one way or the other, it may bias how you decide to um, uh, choose your LIV. So if the LIV is tilted to the left, then a lot of times you'll go right to that last touch vertebrae. And if it's tilted to the right, sometimes they say to actually not go quite so low. So you can save another level. So. You know, a lot of you were talking about T12 versus L1, and then those of you that spend a little bit of time with me in clinic, you'll. Oh, we lost you, Greg. What would you say? Do something different. We lost you there for um, that last statement. Oops, sorry. So I say, you know, I'll say like if I'm in the U.S., I'll, you know, I'll maybe try to cheat the system and go shorter. But if mm -hmm. I'm in the outreach setting, I'll a lot of times go just one one level lower. The main reason is I uh. I'm not sure what follow up is going to be and if people disappear. You know, if you grab if you're grabbing an extra vertebrae, a lot of times that ends up being a little bit safer as far as um, curve correction um, and preventing adding adding on disease. It's just like your paper say, you know, we, we definitely don't like to go to L3 and below for, um, you know, the back pain and progression of adult degenerative disease. So. All right, just a few comments. Great job, Amber. Really, really, really good job. Great, great talk, Amber. I, I think the question of selective fusion and non-selective fusion always comes, uh, you know, in a decision-making process. And uh, in general, uh, you know, if you do a non-selective fusion, probably the patients may be more, as far as the um, uh, res results of, of uh, you know, being happier, they may be happier because they may get better correction. Uh, but definitely functionally in the long run, especially in the, in the, in the you know, few papers that was presented this year, the long term, the function is, is, uh, is not, is affected. So uh, whenever you talk about non-selective fusion and selective fusion, you talk about you know, immediate results, which I think, uh, not immediate, but, you know, a few years, the patients are happier with their image and their correction and their x-ray and all of that. Uh, definitely, you know, you fuse, you know, non-selective is, is, is better, but in, a, in the long run, you know, it's, uh, it's a functionally. So I think in the rule of thumb, we always had that very rarely you had to go below L3. 
and in idiopathic scoliosis. And that was kind of a rule that I always had, but unless they really have a significant double curve, non-flexible and all of that. So that's kind of and the behind your or the other thing is recently that and you can see there's a really a good wave of of uh, growth modulation for patients with idiopathic scoliosis and try to test the non-fusion techniques and uh, and that is it's something that brings the another category of younger AIS patients who are called tweeners and nobody knows what the definition of tweener is, <laughs> but uh, you know they there's no data. But uh, but the patients who are younger uh, AIS patients and maybe all older EOS patients, uh, they might fit into that. And and just recent uh, survey that was done is uh, are, are tweener patients for for gales are those who have open thyroid cartilage and not post menarch and have not reached Sanders 4. Uh, and, and, and that's sort of has, goes with liberal classifications too. But, but these are th things that are being developed. They're, uh, you know, they're trying to get the you know, thoracic tether that you know, was very, you know, there's a lot of excitement for, for not fusing it, but now is 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 uh, is really obvious that really doesn't add much. So there's a less enthusiasm about thoracic selective tether, uh, and they're now focusing on lumbar, you know, curves that doing tether. So those are new things that are coming out, but I don't think there's really any conclusion, and there's a lot of controversy for for that type of approach. People are. Taking it to f f further far to do, you know, mature patients, you know, doing tether and adult patients doing tether and so on. So I just want to get that in your horizon. Thank you so much for a good summary. It's not easy to do AIS in half hour. <laughs> so you did a great job. Yeah. Thanks.